you the real insights from science tech startups learn from experienced founders and experts how to build a successful startup you are listening to the working with startups from science podcast with your host bartosz kaidas Hello and welcome to this very special episode of Working with Startups from Science. This is my second episode in English and I'm really, really excited about this interview. A lot of episodes of my podcast are in German. If you like hearing more episodes about Startups from Science in English, drop me a mail at info at startupsfromscience.com. I'm looking for your feedback. Let's get back to our interview guest. I have the honor and pleasure to speak with Georg Fischer from Mannheim. Georg is Chief Product Manager at SAP and he is working part-time as a coach and lecturer for business innovation and transformation. Georg gained extensive experience in successfully managing distributed and di diverse teams. He is actively coaching companies and individuals in Europe, USA and Latin America with a focus on NGOs and social startups. With that kind of knowledge, we will speak about entrepreneurial spirit and how to teach entrepreneurial mindset. In the end, you learn how you can become a better entrepreneur. Now, you know some details, let's dive into some insights. Hi Georg, what an honor to have you here, welcome. Thank you, Patos. I'm really, really excited to be part of this podcast. Uh, great. We have, we have a nice talk uh, before we, we set up here this interview. And this was so amazing with your insights. And I thought, yeah, you have to be part of this, of this um, podcast. So yeah, before same from my, from my side, yeah. Yeah. Before we start, Georg, you're working at SAP, a global operating company, and you're coaching startups. So tell us, how did you start your career at SAP and why are you coaching startups? Yeah, it's quite a journey, to be open and honest, um, like build, measure, learn uh, in, 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 in startup uh themes, it's also part of my life, right? When I was starting at SAP, I was starting more or less right away interacting with customers. So my first job as a product manager was immediately um, pushing me towards interacting with our installed base globally. So I, I needed immediately, yeah, get into conversations and negotiations and understandings with customers and people I didn't know before. And in this kind of interaction, uh, I learned a lot in, in, uh, in regard to be successful with changing and innovating and trying to convince somebody to purchase something or use something or extend something, that there's not only a technical aspect and a product aspect, but that there's a lot of, of, of human interaction and human exchange um, part of this, this business, right? This was something that I realized right uh, from the beginning. At SAP. Time, at SAP, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and over time, um, yeah, this got more and more established. And then, um, yeah, I was much more working on uh, digital transformation ten, more than 10 years ago. This topic was really increasing where we have a lot of new technologies coming into play and then interacting with large companies. I sometimes realized how hesitant companies can be to, to adapt to new technologies, right? And it was sometimes totally logic that a specific technology would lead to certain um, benefits And then I was sometimes really puzzled that uh, not everything that seems to be logic on a piece of paper or in a diagram is immediately also um, leading to some changes. And, and then I got curious about what is it that if it's logically um, meaningful, why it's so hard to really get it then established and productive. So this became an area where I said, okay, I need to dig, dig in deeper. So what, what did you do then? To gain there are so, so some insights about that yeah first of all i mean dynamics in large enterprises are different compared to smaller enterprises right and these are all kind of the customers that i was working with day day to day and then i realized that 
um, there are quite some yeah, cognitive processes are happening that are also interfering the way we are working and understanding and acting, right? It's not only about facts. It's also about what we think, what we feel, social aspects, emotional aspect. So there's a much, much bigger, bigger universe that is, um, yeah, impacting the actions that we are doing. And I was totally curious about this. Um, and then with methods like design thinking and business model innovation, I try to understand if there are some patterns, right? And then I was more and more uh, dealing with large and small enterprises. And it's like, okay, then let's see how this also works with, with, uh, with startups. And then even now going to universities where students are just, you know, getting their feet wet in, in, in regard to enterprise and to entrepreneurship. And even now continuing at, at schools where also design thinking, um, learnings and lectures and projects are starting really just to try to understand what keeps, yeah, what keeps humans, um, curious, uh, more risk taking, more trying, more experience versus more risk aware, solid, straightforward ways, um, doing things like they have always been done in the past. So I got really hooked uh, by this topic and, and, and uh, yeah, tried to learn a lot about this. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you gained some experience in your, in your, uh, in your position at SAP. And then you wanted to transform this kind of knowledge, what you saw with this big corporation and the uh, small, medium enterprises. You wanted to transform this kind of knowledge to startups, right? Exactly. I mean, uh, 10, 10 years ago, um, Innovator's Dilemma, there were a lot of publications, even Eric Ries, um, Lean Startup. There was like this, um, this belief that there are maybe patterns and tools only working for established companies and some tools and patterns only work for startups. And right now, a lot of these positions have been changed and there everybody kind of established also um, publications and reading and research in the other way. So it seems that there is much, much more in common for agile companies um, than we think. And this divide between a startup being totally different than a large enterprise and with this dynamic and change and agility that is needed today it's not as rigid and strict as we have seen this maybe 10 more years ago and this is something that i wanted to learn and understand and practice myself therefore i try to expose myself towards as much diverse as business situations as possible Mm -hmm. And then you found your own company <laughs> or your own one man uh, company uh, because you're a lecturer and you're, you're giving trainings and workshops uh, and uh, about that kind of knowledge. We will talk uh, in a few seconds. Uh, but let's like going to your, your second, your part time job. What do you exactly do? Yeah, first of all, I'm, as you already said, it's about, uh, in SAP, I was entrepreneur, I am entrepreneur, also um, establishing solutions there. Um, lecturing, my focus is on entrepreneurship. And here, over time, I specialized more and more towards, like, if you look at an empathy map, right, what is done and what is said versus what is felt versus sought, right? And I try to really uh, understand also the stuff that you don't see and the topics like heuristics, mental model, biases, active listening, empathy, and things like that, all of these soft skill, uh, emotional sides of, of the people that you need if you're really looking for a problem and a problem fit, right? A solution fit that is really addressing this. And there's a lot of things happening uh, below the surface and behind the obvious. And this is what I always try to to focus on in my lectures i'm i'm uh, having innovation schools that i'm being a lead coach at uh, lecturing at the university for entrepreneurship and here i also try not always uh, only focus on the tools and the normal aspects that you see but also much much more on, on empathy trying to get a real deep understanding of every stakeholder that is part of your your initial um, idea mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that sounds very, very cool. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of a bit like, uh, uh, innovative, right? Going out from a big company 
gaining some 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 knowledge about some real interesting aspects and transforming this for startups so let's dive into this uh, topic uh, with emotional you you've mentioned that already emotional human being and feelings and stuff like that so tell us uh, what are the most challenges for entrepreneurs uh, that you saw and uh, that you want to um, highlight for entrepreneurs I mean, you can look at many, if you do a Google research, for example, you will find many reasons why startups are failing, right? And, and, um, I don't want to go into the percentage. Uh, it, it depends, but there is a really common sense that a lot of startups are failing because there is no market for their products. And, uh, this one of the top three, four, five additional reasons for failure is that there might be a product that that might have some uh, fit uh, for the for for the market but the way you go to market the may, the way you communicate it uh, for over this product and this value is just not reaching the the target group and therefore a huge majority of companies and startups are failing because they are just not able to produce something the market needs or talk about what the market needs right and this is something that is in general um, uh, a challenge for startups, startups who are very often operating under the level of extreme uncertainty. A lot of stuff is just an idea, assumptions. You look at the business model from partner value proposition towards the customer segment and the, uh, the commercial cycles. At the end, everything is, is, is unproven at the beginning and then you try uh, more and more to get some facts into the equation. And at the end, to be really successful and innovative, you need to, to meet four criteria. First of all, your offering needs to be feasible so you can make it. It needs to be desirable so somebody wants it. It needs to be viable so you can pertain and uh, continue existing as your company and even grow. And last but not least, in these days, I think it's all already obvious, also sustainability, right? And when, when all of these aspects are meeting, you can increase the probability of success. For startups from science, and this is something that we are focusing on today, I saw in the last many, many years that I'm doing this kind of coaching and working with these startups is that the focus is clearly on the feasibility, right? So people are coming with a great idea. They, they invented something. They realized something. And then they're extremely focusing on this feasibility. If we go towards the other aspects, maybe if we can park sustainability for a second. And when we talk about, um, a desirability so somebody should want to use it enjoy to use it and sees a significant significant value in using this this product and this solution this is a human aspect the same with viability right somebody needs to purchase it somebody needs to make a big buying decision investment decision right and these are can be totally different mindset it can be totally different environments stories channels whatever right so, but this, they are both human human aspects right and coming from a total academic approach where everything is rational and logic then addressing viability and uh, desirability is very often um, requiring that you leave your comfort zone and maybe do things that is less predictable and maybe less logic than you are used to. Yeah, sure. I, I see that quite quite often with, with scientists, right? Uh, they have uh, real problems and challenges to get into that per perspective, right? So what do you think, how can we help these scientists to, yeah, to, to solve that problem with desirability and, uh, yeah, to, to, to take the perspective on and to solve that problem? First of all, the, the awareness needs to be there and then every kind of support to do this much earlier, right? The thing is that sometimes you're going too far with your development and with your realization of your idea. And if you would have talked to somebody, there would be, um, yeah, pivots or adjustments being possible to be done. The thing is that, and this is also shown in, in, in early prototyping, for example, if you share a prototype at a very early stage compared 
to when you share it at a very, very late stage is that you get totally different feedback. So if you have a sketch just on a piece of paper, listen, I'm thinking about this and that, and then you do some drawings on a piece of paper, then you get extremely um, basic feedback also, right? Whether this idea at all makes sense or whether there are some totally dramatical architectural changes required or design changes required. If you already have a totally fixed prototype that you share with the UI and screens and everything done and ready, you get totally different kind of feedback. People want to be polite. Nobody, a very limited number of people would then tell you, okay, this idea doesn't work at all for me, right? This is totally irrelevant and nonsense, right? People would say, oh, yeah, I like it in general. Maybe the color should be a different. There should be a different logo, uh, some text and things like that, right? So therefore, it's really essential that you try to involve people, customers who are paying and users who are using, can be patients depending on the industry you're in, right? But there are people with different, with different needs and different rationales behind it that you address this early on. Otherwise, it can be extremely expensive and extremely painful um, if you realize this at a very late point in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've said here in, in, in our talk, no matter how scientific or technical a topic is, at the end, it's humans that matter. So, yeah, maybe this quite, it's, it's quite, uh, good for us now, but, uh, like, how do you mean that? Maybe you can little, explain a little bit that topic regarding to that, what you said before. Yeah, I would, would like to, to share it with an example, right? Uh, um, I was working with a company, uh, with a startup, and they were trying to produce something for retailers. And uh, what they didn't do is they didn't differentiate in their pitches between the, the person who running a supermarket and the persons who are going into a supermarket, mm -hmm. right? So they try to address a specific need and, and think, okay, everything around the supermarket is, is similar. When, when I heard this pitch, Of course, I'm not running a supermarket, but I'm going there, right? And what happened is that when this pitch happened, I realized a few of these arguments and the stories and the, and the whole rationale I could follow as a consumer, but some are not. And some I re even realized, no, this is actually not true. Right? So it was the opposite. And in regard to, and when we continue with the coaching aspects, we totally separated the storyline for a user and the storyline for a shop owner. And when we discussed this a little bit, we realized that it was easier for them to talk to somebody who is going into a supermarket because that could be family and friend, right? So the, the hurdle of, of picking up the phone or being with your friends anyhow and ask them as a consumer was totally easy. But then mm -hmm. really try to establish the connection to people who are running a supermarket, right? And very often this is franchise uh, and relatively easy actually to go there. There was such a big hurdle that people didn't uh, want to go there, right? And, this and why? Of, why is that? Why is that? What do you think? Why is it I so, think it's, so stressful? It's comfort. It's, it's the comfort zone, right? I mean, I, I, it's easier for me if, I, if I, I meet a few colleagues at the office and talk to them. Because then everything that is, is happening before um, I can talk to somebody, I need to, uh, who are you, where are you, are you relevant for me in this context, things like that, right? So I have so much information about the people I know already versus if I don't have this, and not only I don't know how to address you, but I don't know maybe even how to reach you. I, I mean, if I think about the supermarket close here, there is a big name on the on the entrance. Maybe I would have just went into the store, asked somebody, hey, excuse me, is there any way uh, that I can reach them? Or I would look at, look at the internet uh, pages, whether there's a telephone number or email address, and try to reach this person, right? So it's, it's not so predictable, right? It doesn't feel so I know exactly how to get them, right? You need to try something out. And you, you might, might, might be rejected at somebody. Sorry. Um, if you don't have a special reason, we can just give you the number of the boss or get him down here. He's busy, things like that. Right. So you're putting yourself into risk. You're putting yourself into a situation of failure, unsecurity. 
uh, uh, things like that. And this is not uh, what, what everybody likes, especially if you're already extremely in love with your product and with your solution, right? So mm -hmm. you're fearing to be hurt, uh, fearing to be disappointed. This is something that keeps you away from, mm -hmm. from doing this. And how do you, or how are you motivating people to get or step out of their comfort zone? First of all, it's really that's what also some, no matter what I do in all my lectures and exercises and workshops, there is some sort of interviewing there, right? And it's really mm -hmm. like interviewing not only for the exercise of doing it, but also very much playing at the beginning, right? Just putting random questions on the, on the, on the beamer. And then asking people, okay, what do you think? Is this a good interview question or not? Right? Just with the with the approach of, of, of quiz and, and trial and error, really try to understand what happens with specific questions. Because questionnaires can be extremely riskful. Uh, if you're asking the wrong question, uh, then you maybe create even some pseudo evidence that is then exactly uh, um, uh, supporting going into the wrong direction versus if you're opening up, have an open mind and really be, be your most biggest critic at the beginning, right? Um, and, and really asking, okay, is this really proven now? Is it really a big need? Is there really a market behind this read, right? What is the value of my idea, right? And I try to really make people doing it once and if they done it in if they done it in a professional way like they have a good interview guide i always uh, emphasize on one is doing the interview and is only focusing on the interview and then you have somebody who's the observer and note taker and th that person is just writing down everything they see was their hesitation uh, being nervous and things like that so what you see what you feel everything to capture everything in, different hints and ideas um, that, that um, maybe the one asking the question is not able to do because he's so much into it. And if they done this and then consolidate it and synthesize it, I'm just doing it right uh, right now. I had a call last week with, with a couple of PhD students who are working on a project and they are just Uh, did the interview phase and now try to consolidate all academics, right? And now going behind this facts and the emotions, right? People give you 10 facts, but which were the facts where you really had the people they had the feeling they got annoyed or they got excited or irritated or things like that? What stuck out, right? Is it just a number counting? Five people said A, seven people said B, or was there something that they really got very emotional or passionate about where you can really see there's an energy behind it, right? Not just, yeah, this and that, where you can really see, oh, wow, this was really something where they got totally excited. There must be something behind it. Because if there's no energy, there might be no market and might be mm -hmm. no investment. Yeah, great. Let's let's uh, jump into that point because, um, you know, uh, I see or saw a lot of scientists who, who are going very analytical in this interview situation. And um, uh, I, I see that quite often that they struggle with uh, recognizing these kind of things that you mentioned, energy, passion, something like that, or 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 interest or something like yeah something like that so which techniques do you would recommend uh, for scientists to prepare for this kind of interview customer interview situation to recognize these kind of yeah attributes that that you mentioned it's exactly a very good question because in all of this we need to differentiate two things first of all how to do it that is kind of technical right so i can learn yeah. somebody uh, how to write a good interview guide what are good questions what what not good question one should ask the question one should write down the answers and every observation and things like that that is the one thing but if you are not having the right mindset there is no tool and process in the world that can compete with this right so the mm -hmm. thing is first of all you need to understand the tools and techniques number one And then you need to have the right mindset. And, and you mentioned it at the beginning. It's really about the mindset. If I want to really want it, that's, that's the, the definition of empathy. We can maybe uh, go into this in, in a second, right? If you really want to understand this, 
person and not be satisfied with the first answer that you get, but really try to understand, does this make sense? Is this really, why is this person like this? And then really try, okay, interesting. Tell me more. Uh, can you explain me? Can we, can you share an example when it extremely worked good and when it worked extremely bad, right? And then really understand how we function. Right? And we have so many, I mean, the, the, the brain over time really developed in, in, into a system, um, that is summarizing, interpreting, ignoring, filtering, whatever, right? So don't believe everything you think, right? We are not ob objective people. And if there is a lack of information, we have so much experience, we've completed, right? And at the end, we don't know if, if this is something we believe or something we heard, right? So you need to have the techniques and you really need to the mindset, I do want to understand this. All right. So yeah, let's, let's, uh, uh go into a little bit into this empathy uh, thing. So, um, you, you mentioned that this is a very uh, useful, yeah, I wouldn't say technique, but a very useful, uh, yeah, attribute. Um, they are people they, yeah, may have empathy or more or less. How can you train that empathy and, and change that perspe perspective? That's actually an extremely interesting question because empathy is a word that everybody is using. A lot of people are using, but if you then ask, okay, what is the definition of empathy? What do you think is real empathy, right? What, or being empathetic? What mm -hmm. does it mean, right? And very often you hear, yeah, be in somebody else's shoes, right? This is, right. in my opinion, yeah. just a second perspective, yeah. right? If you're in somebody else's shoes, then you saw the same a problem or solution out of different shoes. And then I was really trying to understand uh, what, what is a better de definition of empathy, right? And I, I was browsing and, and reading a lot of articles and services, things like that. And there was one definition I really liked, right? It sounds a little bit esoteric, um, but I really like it because this is actually what I, I would immediately say, yeah, this is something I could sign. Right? Oh, and now please is... reveal this, this secret. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's the result of long work <laughs> yeah. in the internet, right? And, and the, the thing is, was really like to try to understand a different person in such a way that you not only can see and feel what this person is seeing and feeling in the moment, but can even predict if something is happening, how this person would react, see, and feel in the future, right? It's really like the two personalities are merging into one. And as mm -hmm. this will never be possible, empathy is the constant trying of reaching this state, right? This is not something, okay, now I'm empathic and I totally understand what Bartosz wants and things like that. It's over. Now it's really something that is continuing it's a constant trying of see and reflecting and sinking and adjusting yourself and really see okay is this is something that works wow this is a great yeah a great definition and i am feeling like yeah if, if you could reach that state you, you could become a mastermind right because you could, could be predict because, yeah you could yeah, predict then you, then you people's can, Exactly. Actions. And then you can say something will be as successful in the market or not, right? This, this is the kin thing, right? So you yeah. know, okay, if I go to the market with this product, will it be successful or not? If I can put myself uh, so much into the, to the, um, feeling and thinking of my, my customers that I know they buy it, yes or no, right? That would take away all risk. Okay. Got it. So, uh, yeah, regarding to that, uh, scientists, how they can teach or how they can learn that kind of skill that is actually um yeah even a little bit sad because if you look and this is not so old i mean daniel kahneman is really one of my <coughs> my heroes who changed uh, a lot in in the way we think and feel about our brain despite many many other amazing brains who have a huge impact on the way we are doing businesses today is um, that at the end, we are built, we as humans are built in a way that we are automatically empathic person, right? And there's a lot of amazing examples showing this. Maybe I can just share one, yeah, one, um, one, one uh, research I read about is that they were doing with, with two people who have a very, very strong relational uh, 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 
the emotional relation, right? Maybe parents and kids or a married couple or, or a friend couple, or, but people who are really, really very, um, very close. And then they did a test and say, okay, listen, one person is coming into an MRI and then they, they get electroshocks and then they are measuring the, the brain activities as well as the electricity on the skin. Mm -hmm. And then this person became some electroshocks and they got increased, increased, increased. And then they were measuring what is the brain doing and what is the skin doing. And then they said, okay, now let's change this. Now the other person who was the observer got into this tube and the other person stood out observing it. And then they were pretending as if they would do exactly the same exercise, like the mm -hmm. person in the MRI would get electroshocks, but they didn't. So mm -hmm. the person in the MRI had no changes in the way the brain signals, nor the skin, but the person observing knows exactly how it felt to be mm -hmm. in there. So the only person who were reacting as if they would get electroshock was the person outside watching, right? And this mm -hmm. is the power of empathy. So we have so-called mirror neurons in our brain, and they are exactly able to react on the other people. So we are, we are in the perception, especially in the academic. And I was maybe 10, 15 years ago, the same way, right? That we think empathy, we are thinking people and we need to learn empathy, but it's the other way around, right? We are given born, built, empathic people and human beings and, and, and beings on this planet in general, right? And this is nothing we, we, we need to learn. We are built for that. We just have to allow it and mm. get it back into our behaviors and, pa and patterns. This is not, it, nothing that everybody can do yeah. this. Yeah. But like, um, maybe there are some, some listeners who maybe they are thinking like, yeah, but being emphatic, um, empathic, isn't, is, isn't it a weakness? Like, You are in, in negotiations and you have to be strong and you don't care what people are thinking or feeling and you have to be strong and, and empathy is some, some kind of weakness. What do you think about that? Looking at two aspects, number one, for large enterprises, if you're working on your careers and level, this is one story uh, where, where I heard about things like that, but this is not the topic we want to do today. The thing is, okay, um, but, but, but somehow interesting. <laughs> yeah, maybe for a different topic of a, of a podcast, then we need a different title, right? Okay. But if I look into into the startup, right, what I'm sometimes lacking, and this is why, yeah, you heard it maybe a million times, but still I have it in my lectures all the time. I want you to fall in love with the problem and don't fall in love with the solution, right? Because if you are falling in love with the problem, then you and you really are creating the willingness and the motivation to seriously solve this problem. If you really think this is something that is bothering a lot of people, right? And today there are technologies and tools that can overcome this, right? And I want to do this. And then if you're just closely solving, you still miss it, right? And if you're really motivated to say, okay, I want to solve this problem for this person in a way that creates so much more value for them than I want in return, then empathy is one key. Next to, also in a very interesting uh, topic, active listening, which is also something I invested quite some time to really understand what it means, what's, what is active listening. So empathy yeah, can is you please? Thing. Yeah, can you please describe what active listening is? Yeah, my pleasure. Because also, again, here, active listening, if you just look at it, uh, it sounds like a contradiction, right? Listening, if I listen to some music, typically it's a very passive activity, right? I lay on the couch mm -hmm. and chill a little bit. But what makes uh, listening active? And also here I did some, some research, and there is a really good psych uh, psychologist from the US, C.R. Rogers, who did a lot of research on this active listening. And there's one definition that I also like. If you want to practice active listening, it is your responsibility to make the other talk. Mm -hmm. So it's not something passive. It's really your responsibility. So if the, if it's slowing down, if it's a short answer, if it's obvious answer, things like that, right? It's, it's your job to make the other person talk. 
Mm-hmm. And this is also totally fascinating if you see what happens behind the scene. If you are listening to somebody, I mean, if, if now you and I, we meet somewhere, right? And then we are getting into a conversation. We don't know each other so much. If you are sharing something where I am active listening, this is one of the fastest ways to create deep trust. The fastest, one of the fastest way to create trust to a person. And if you established yourself as an active listener, this person is coming back. Because mm-hmm. they feel heard, they feel understood, they feel valued, right? Because what you did is you showed them, okay, listen, I'm here. I'm fully leaning towards you. I have time. I am showing interest. I'm encouraging you. And I really try to understand. And here we come again, because this was a very interesting question that you asked, Patrick. Isn't it risky? Uh, I just want to do it. Because active listening, and I didn't understand this at the beginning, because they always said this is a very risky approach, and you should only practice active listening if you have a huge self-confidence and and if you really have a good good stand and a solid stand. And I was always trying to understand why is this, why is this? Because the thing is, if you really try to understand and listen, the risk is... If you take away all the differences, like maybe they are having a different approach and you don't like this, right? And, and we, we have some mm-hmm. problem mm-hmm. to try to understand something um, if it's not towards our values and towards our beliefs. But if we get over this and really try to understand somebody completely, we are facing the risk to realize that the other person might have a valid point or in the worst case is even right and even more right than you are. And here we are again, if I want to be successful with a product and and with an offering and with a solution, um, do I want to hear the truth and do I really want to understand the situation of a buyer and a user, then you need to do this. And if you don't do this, you're just increasing the risk of providing something the market doesn't need or provide something the market need, but aren't able to address it in a way that the market understands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Very cool. That's a really cool concept. I know that concept from, from, from coach, from, from my coaching perspective. Mm -hmm. So to gain, to to understand really what people uh, want to discuss with you or want, want to, want you from, from, from your coach, uh, coaching experience. Uh, but uh, in this kind of context for entrepreneurs, I mean, uh, the question was also how to become a good entrepreneur with, with that kind of knowledge. So, I mean, um, uh, entrepreneurs, they struggle with that kind of, you know, in this, in this conversation, they always tend to, to describe the solution, right? If they talk with, with customers, it's like, uh, do you like this and that, uh, or do you have this and that problem? Uh, and then it's like a little bit listening and then this, this uh, feeling of I have to sell or I have to present the, the solution already in the first talk. So how is your advice? How can entrepreneurs train that skill, active listening? And the, the and how can they avoid like, um, selling? Uh, people the solution already and um, yeah and how to avoid that kind of uh, yeah mm, strong feeling that they have inside them right yeah because there's even more right it's what we just talk where like like behavior patterns but there is more when we go back into us how the brain works right and mm-hmm. the brain works as a it's, it's a it's a systematic cheater right don't believe it Every second, every second, we are all exposed to 20 million sensoric impulses. 20 million, whether it's smell here, I mean, it's the clothes on the body, it's the noise outside the window, maybe the t-shirt is making some noise, 20 million. Conscious, we only are aware of 40. The rest is somewhat not going into our um objective understanding in the moment, right? So this is beyond it. And Mm -hmm. therefore, the brain create a lot of heuristics, the way we are automatically working, right? Anchoring. The first kind of information you set is 
driving the further conversation. It's, it's, it created an anchor and it's putting the whole conversation in a different direction. Extremely strong bias, confirmation bias, right? We tend in an, in a conversation to always hear in case of doubt more things that are supportive towards our opinion and our ideas versus the other way around, right? And the thing is, maybe this is even the benefit of um, scientific startups if, if you just try to understand it, right? It's not rocket science. It's nothing bad. It's not, and you can learn this and read about this like any other chemistical or uh, physiological laws that are out there as well or mathematical laws. So they are also uh, functions and patterns that are working. And if you know them and you can test them, I did uh, trainings in regard to this um, early prototyping and customer feedback and just did some exercises, right? Where I was trying in an audience of really uh, intellectual trained academics to exactly provoke this, right? I mm -hmm. set an anchor and then I was asking questions. And then depending on the anchor, I would see if people are, I don't know how many people are living in a specific country and then how many tulips are in the world, right? And if you take mm. a smaller country, in average, people are thinking there are less kind of tulips in the world than the other way around. Or if you name uh, women names and man names, and then just the women names are famous and the men not, but there are much more men names than women names but at the end everybody thinks yeah yeah there were much more women names because they know them and they are available in their mind and then you're tricked and the thing is just to accept that this is a fact and then you can really um, create a way of interacting with others that is trying i don't think it will ever be perfect right but it tries to be as neutral and as complete as possible by really okay mm -hmm. can you explain me step by step there are techniques to overcome these kind of um mental models and heuristics and things like that right and if you are mm -hmm. just try to understand um that you are working like this and it's totally okay uh, but it's the same like we are taking too much sugar and sweets and stuff like that you need to build in something into your routines maybe don't have anything at home like sweets right otherwise i'm too weak and the same is true with this kind of interacting with others that you try to have techniques and step by step and some guidance and to really work it through and, and maybe just to close this sentence uh, there was a word when i was reading this eric reese um lean startup and it's in my head because i was reading this word five times i didn't understand mm. what it means right and what it says is as a startup, don't paint the rosiest picture. <laughs> now I understand the rosiest picture. Right? Yeah. Don't always um, interpret mm -hmm. facts in a way that they are pleasing your ideas, but really always try. Every time mm -hmm. you look at your ideas, every time you look at to, uh, customers and users to try to understand, did I understand this correctly? Is this really valid? Uh, things like that become more a critical friend of yourself versus just somebody who always says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. You're the best. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Georg, amazing insights that you shared with us. I, I think that we need to set up a new or next uh, podcast uh, about that topic and describing that uh, really in detail because it's so fascinating because it's an another yeah point of view right on this kind of um, interviews and the entrepreneurial mindset so what i want to ask you is um, my one of my 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 yeah one of my last question i have another one but this is uh, regarding to that topic um Do you see a difference between big companies and startups? And we, because we have now talked about entrepreneurial mindset, but it's like, is it easier for bigger companies to reach this product market fit than for entrepreneurs? How do you think? Wait, it's not an easy question to answer, right? I mean, first of all, if you're an entrepreneur or entrepreneur, you have quite different setups, right? Leveraging mm -hmm. the infrastructure of a large company, of course, gives you a lot of risk. Um, and if every organization is working towards you, uh, you can get uh, quite some speed and scale. Um, but in the other direction, also, there is a lot of 
of different um, areas and organizational parts that need to be convinced about something that creates um, also some effort and maybe time delay. Uh, mm. I would, it's not a scientific answer, but out of my gut feeling is if you're a smaller uh, corporation, you're much faster and more able uh, um, maybe also to meet a specific window of opportunity to do so. And to op to be open and honest, um, if, if you really start, because this is then, what, what is the idea behind doing, right? And if you just go to the to a city, like in the city of Mannheim, if you go with open minds to the different shops and businesses and try to understand, right, what do you think is their main motivation, right, to make the life and the business easy for them or and enjoyable for them or easy and good for the others, right? And very often I think I always wanted to have this kind of store and I want to have it like this and that and things like that. So very sometimes I really see people who have the feeling they only created this business for them, right? To be easy to go for them. But if you are really trying to think, okay, I, I have I have the drive, I have the motivation, I have the education, I have the skills to really create something that could have a purpose that can have an impact. And then mm -hmm. you really should try to get the maximum out of this. And in regard to maximize these benefits that you have, you really need to understand, you need to create a good understanding of the market, a good understanding of the player in the market, a good understanding of the people in this market to really try and say, okay, I really want to help them. It's, it's my, it, it's, it's a kick. And this is what drives me, right? For me, this is always a quiz. It's a riddle. Mm -hmm. How to best do that for them? And to me, it's not about to create my idea and make my vision reality, but it's really try, am I able to really hit the nail right on the head and provide exactly what they are looking for? This for me okay. make, make me addicted. To this. <laughs> Great picture. Yeah, great picture. Thank you very much for that. So coming to our last question or my last question, um, yeah, to summarize that a little bit up, what are your, uh, um, f I don't know, three, five key advices or, or main takeaways um, that you want to give or share with our listeners? First of all, really, it's like um, empathy and active listening should be two topics that you that you should have a look at, right? What I like about I'm really a design thinker, not because this is something hip or whatever, because it, it's a total logical approach of how to solve a problem, right? First of all, understand what is the problem worse to be solved. Uh, don't, don't take every problem immediately. Also try to understand this is a real problem and it is the worst to solve. Nothing is more disappointing than being successful in something that doesn't matter at all, right? This is waste in my understanding, right? Then it's really about creating empathy, understanding, become an expert, right? You learn so much, you experience so much, and that is really amazing. And then you first start going into this solution space, right? And there is a lot of aspect so my my advice um to 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 startups would really be uh, take this as an exercise take this picture from the beginning innovation and success lays in the middle of feasibility desirability viability and sustainability all four areas require a different set of tools and expertise you can learn that There is so much coaching and offering at each university, startup center, Mannheim, Heidelberg, Darmstadt, all over the world. There is so much support of people who join the way for a specific period of time. Get the knowledge that you don't know. Um, accept the existence of these different aspects and see this as a huge opportunity for everybody to grow. Don't be afraid. Um, it needs to be done. It makes you grow. It's outside your comfort zone, but success is not inside your comfort zone and success is not in your box, right? You need to think outside the box. You need to go outside the comfort zone. And this is also outside logic and mathematic. It's also in humans and in emotions and in social status. All of this together creates the big picture and then provides a real good solution that is solving the problem that you are aiming for and helping people at the end. 
Oh, Georg, thank you very, very much. This was some nice advices. I guess uh, our listeners feel that and can can take that with them and uh, yeah, maybe use it for their own startup. So, Georg, thank you very much for your time, for your insight, sharing with us your learnings. This was a very cool interview. I wish you lots of luck and, uh, yeah, great, great, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, great topics on that and, and great lectures and, yeah, telling people how to do it because I feel that this is, yeah, kind of a puzzle, uh, piece that is missing in our startup world. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Patrick. It was a lot of fun talking to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so this was the episode with uh, Georg Fischer. This was a really nice talk. Don't forget to subscribe and yeah, just click on the hit on the subscribe button and never miss an episode. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.